my name is Nigel Curtis. So I'd like to start by thanking the ESPID organisers for asking me to speak to you today about the non-specific effects of BCG vaccination trials and tribulations. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. And I'm speaking to you today from Melbourne in Australia, where we're currently in a level four lockdown, which means we're only allowed out for a maximum of two hours and no more than five kilometers from our home. And of course, always wearing a mask. And I hope you're all well where you're watching this from. So you might ask why am I speaking to you about BCG? And of course you will all know um, that by looking at Wikipedia, that the reason I'm talking to you about this is that I invented this vaccine when I was a medical student. Now, for some reason, this Wikipedia page has now been edited and it no longer says this, but I'm pleased to say that if you um, follow Instagram, which I'm sure you will do, and you follow tuberculosis BCG vaccine, um, you'll be pleased to see this post that I'm uh, so pleased to see that Professor Nigel Curtis invented BCG. Hashtag vaccine, hashtag genius. And this has been picked up all over the media and more recently um, it's been picked up by Donald Trump. Um, and although it's fake news, he posted this on Twitter. And tremendous that Professor Nigel Curtis invented uh, BCG vaccine to prevent severe COVID-19. Wish I'd been in his trial. And you can see this has already had a number of retweets and likes. Now, Actually, of course, you will know that BCG was created by Albert Calmet and Camille Garin at the, in the early 19th century um, to prevent tuberculosis. And the interesting thing that's come um, about in the last decade or two is the realization that this vaccine has effects not just on the adaptive immune system, but on innate immunity. And you're going to hear a lot about that from my colleague, Miha Natia, in the next talk. So now we understand that following BCG vaccination and the immune response, there is a specific immune response that protects against the target T disease, which of course is tuberculosis. But there's also a non-specific immune response, uh, which leads to off-target effects. And these are sometimes called the accidental advantages of um, some vaccines um, or heterologous immune um, effects. And these effects are a number of different clinical things from protecting against other infections and perhaps allergies, and I'll come to some of those shortly. And so the overall effect of BCG vaccination is a combination of both these specific and non-specific, or sometimes called off-target, or better called off-target effects. And of course, over the last six months, the big question has been whether these off-target effects could be used to protect against COVID-19. And that's really what I'm going to focus this talk on today. And over the last six months, there's been an explosion of literature. So if you now search for BCG and COVID-19, as I have done here in early October, uh, there are now over 136 publications discussing um, the use of BCG vaccine to reduce the impact of COVID-19. So why do we think that BCG might reduce the impact of COVID-19? Well, the main reason is that we believe, or we know that BCG induces trained immunity, and I'm not gonna discuss that in too much detail now, because as I said, behind the tier, we'll talk about this shortly, but essentially this is the understanding that BCG can um, induce metabolic and subsequent epigenetic changes in, their, in innate immune cells to boost the immune response. It's been known for decades that BCG can protect against multiple different infections in animal models. This has been right back from the kind of 60s and 70s when these studies first started. And this has been reviewed uh, nicely in these publications here, which talk about the various studies where a number of different animals have been immunized with BCG to see if they can, can reduce the severity of infections from viruses, bacteria, and protozoa. And relevant to this discussion are experiments from the 70s where mice were inoculated with BCG to see if they could be protected against the Mengo virus, which interestingly is a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus like the SARS-CoV-2. So in this experimental model at least, BCG was able to protect against this, um, um, this virus in mice. So what about um, humans? Well, the most evidence, the best evidence, and perhaps the biggest impact of BCG's off-target effects has been in preventing deaths in neonates and young infants. And there have been a number of randomized controlled trials of BCG vaccination in neonates, and predominantly, or a large number of those, 
in West Africa and Guinea-Bissau by Peter Arby's group, which show results similar to this, that there is reduced mortality in those infants that were vaccinated with BCG at birth. And that reduction in mortality or increased survival is due to protection against infections other than tuberculosis, the kind of infections that kill you in the first few months of life, including, of course, respiratory infections. What about in, uh, in lower mortality countries? Well, there are at least two very large studies, including um, tens of thousands, and in the, um, in the case of the paper on the right, hundreds of thousands of cases in retrospective studies that have shown reduced respiratory tract infections and sepsis um, admissions um, in these studies. But I hasten to add, these are, of course, um, retrospective studies and come with the caveats that that involves. But there is at least one randomized controlled trial that shows a benefit, a beneficial off-target effect of BCG vaccine. And that comes from this study of a new vaccine in adolescents in South Africa, which included two control groups of both a placebo vaccine and just a regular BCG. And in this case, it was revaccination because all of these adolescents had previously had BCG. But what was found, this was not the main point of the study, but one of the secondary or a, a further outcome uh, on exploratory outcome. It was found that those adolescents that had BCG compared with the placebo group had a 73% reduction in upper respiratory tract infection. So quite a large effect, but relatively small numbers, of course. And finally, the human challenge model, which you'll hear about later from my colleague, uh, Miha Natia, has shown that BCG in adults can reduce reduction um, in yellow fever virus used as a human challenge uh, in a human challenge model. So in terms of randomized controlled trials, there are now 12 trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov uh, looking at whether BCG might have an impact on COVID-19. And here you can see the numbers of, of participants in each of these trials, and you can see there are a number of different countries worldwide. Most of these trials are in healthcare workers, um, and some of them are in the elderly, and, they, and, um, and you can see they all have various different names. Um, I think the winner, I quite like battle, but I think the winner is certainly the badass study which is being done in the USA. But the one I'm going to talk to you about today is the one that I'm leading, and that is the BRACE study, um, which we're leading from here in Melbourne. So this study is in 10,000 healthcare workers in 33 sites in Australia, the Netherlands, the UK, Spain, and Brazil. And in this randomized controlled trial, we're randomizing healthcare workers to either receive the BCG vaccine or placebo and following them for 12 months. And we're asking the healthcare workers, every time they have an episode of illness with symptoms that might be COVID-19, which I think we now know is almost any symptom, we're asking them to um, have test um, to record their symptoms on an app for every day that they have those symptoms and to undergo testing by PCR for um, SARS-CoV-2. And then we're also doing surveys at three, six, nine and 12 months via the app to pick up any missing data and to find out about any other illnesses that our participants might have had because of course we'll also be interested in whether BCG prevents other infections. We're also doing um, taking blood at baseline and three monthly, um, not just, well, for one reason we're doing that is to look for asymptomatic seroconversion for those who've had asymptomatic COVID-19. So we'll look at SARS-CoV-2 antibodies because we know that they can be relatively short-lived. We're now needing to do that every three months. Um, and also we'll be using those blood samples for, um, for immunoprofiling and for systems vaccinology to try and understand um, how BCG works and to compare those who do get severe COVID-19 and those who don't to understand more about the underlying immunology. So well, there's quite a deep immuno, Im, immunology product underlining this clinical trial. Now, what I'd like to finish with is by just talking about some of the, um, the tribulations part of my talk, the pitfalls and limitations of BCG trials. And I'd like to start with the choice of outcome and the reason why we have 10,000 participants in our trial. So I think we all know that after exposure to SARS-CoV-2, a large proportion of individuals will have asymptomatic disease. And obviously some will go on to have mild or moderate symptoms. Some will have severe symptoms, but that many of those will be non-hospitalized, but some will require hospitalization. Some of those will require oxygen ventilation. And of course, some people die. Now, the um, in our trial, we're measuring severe COVID-19 
as not just those that are hospitalized, but those that are severely unwell at home. And the primary outcome that we happen to have chosen is incapacitation for three days, which we're measuring by those who are unable to get out of bed or if it weren't for quarantine would be unable to work because we think that is a clinically important measure of severe COVID-19. And that's really what we want a vaccine to prevent. And we're also, of course, measuring symptomatic COVID-19. And I guess the hypothesis is that by improving the immune response to SARS-CoV-2, that we would reduce both severe COVID-19 and symptomatic COVID-19. But there is one thing that I'm worried about, and that's that with an improved immune response, it's quite possible that something else happens. It's quite possible that we reduce severe COVID-19, but we increase symptomatic COVID-19. It might be that by inducing a better immune response, individuals have more symptoms. Now, this would still be a good thing. We'd be very happy if BCG could reduce severe disease, even if it was at the cost of slightly more um, mild disease that was more like just a, a simple cold, for example. But in order to really detect these cases with severe disease, you need a trial with 10,000 or to at least be doing um, some kind of combination of systematic analysis of the um, other trials. And so um, aside from just looking at symptomatic COVID-19, trials have a number of different um, outcomes, including absenteeism. The next issue to consider is the timing of BCG vaccination and whether there's any possibility that BCG could make COVID-19 worse and fortunately, this um, study from the Netherlands has provided us with some uh, reassurance that this isn't the case by looking at other studies that have been done during um, using BCG during this pandemic. The next issue is how long before exposure um, would you need to have the vaccine? And also how long it would take for the vaccine to be effective and how long would the vaccine last? And of course, for many vaccines, we know how long um, vaccination lasts and whether we need to have boosting vaccines. But for BCG, even for tuberculosis, it's not clear quite how long protection lasts. So in terms of duration effectiveness, I'd like to um, just highlight this one of, one of many papers such as this. This was a study from Israel that looked at adults between 35 and 41 and compared those who earlier had had, or in childhood, had had BCG or had not had BCG and found that there was no difference in the rate of COVID-19 um, in those who did or did not have BCG vaccination. But as I pointed out in a comment online to this, um, this study, this isn't the question that we're asking in our BCG trials because we wouldn't expect that BCG given many years, in this case decades earlier, would protect against COVID-19 because we believe that trained immunity that, was, that is induced by BCG, um, it's a very unlikely to be long lasting over, over many years and is probably abrogated by other infections and other intervening vaccines. And so you can see more if you um, go to my Twitter. Shameless plug for my Twitter account. The next issue are the um, other factors that can influence the vaccine response. And this nice review by Petra Zimmerman um, discusses all the different factors that can influence the immune response to vaccine. But there is one very important one in relation to BCG vaccination, and that is the strain of BCG vaccine. And there are a number of different strains of BCG um, vaccine um, that occurred because after its creation, this vaccine was sent all over the world and was grown in culture for many decades before seed lots were frozen down. And these different um, strains of BCG um, we have shown have, um, have been reviewed by here by Nicole Ritz, who's of course the convener of our next ESPID in Geneva. Um, and in this review, um, she, she provides the evidence that BCG um, changes and um, not only has phenotypic differences but um, induces differences in the immune response and studies we've done in Melbourne have shown that and this study here has shown that different strains also have different um, effects on innate immunity. So it's quite important which strain we're using and the problem is that almost all of the studies that I talked about before are using just one strain which is BCG Danish. And there's one study from the States that is using BCG Thais, but the remainder are all using this one strain. So all of our trials, if you like, are in the same BCG strain basket. And that's a worry um, if one strain is better than another. Um, and I would just highlight why I'm worried about that. And that's from this study from last year, early last year. There was a study from India that looked at the effect of BCG in um, low birth weight um, neonates in Indian um, intensive care units and showed no benefit of BCG. There was no difference in mortality in those who did and did not have BCG. And in the commentary that I wrote following that 
um, publication, I made the point that this was a study using BCG Russia. And one of the hypotheses has been that some of the strains such as BCG Russia may not have the um, same off-target effects as some of the other strains. So this is a caution and it's a great shame that we're not able to do studies easily as a whole other lecture using different strains because essentially because of their availability and the regulatory and the regulatory requirements in terms of using those strains in trials. The next issue I'd like to discuss is non-live vaccines. Um, now what about if and many of the trials that are occurring are being done at the same time as influenza vaccine because of course it's very important that healthcare workers receive their flu jab. So the first question is, what is the effect of BCG on influenza vaccine? And in this systematic review by Petra Zimmerman and in a trial that we did in neonates in Australia, um, there's fairly good evidence that if and the BCG actually improves the immune response to subsequent um, vaccines. And there's a study here, um, again from the Netherlands, showing that um, specifically for the influenza vaccine, the prior BCG vaccine actually increases your antibody response. So I think in general, that is good news. But the second question is, what is the effect of influenza vaccine if it's given before BCG? What is the effect of influenza vaccine on BCG's off-target effects? And there's a potential concern that comes from this systematic review, which was a WHO, um, um, which, was start, which, was, um, which was requested by the WHO to look at the off-target effects of vaccines. And one of the conclusions of this review was that non-live vaccines, and in particular DTP, which is really where the evidence comes from, may have opposite off-target effects to live vaccines. Now, I um, emphasize that the, um, many of the, uh, much of the data for DTP comes from observational studies, necessarily because it's so difficult to do randomized controlled studies. But nonetheless, if you look at this particular figure, it shows a quite interesting effect. And these, for each of these studies, it looks at the mortality following vaccination with BCG, DTP, or a measles containing vaccine, with lower mortality to the left after BCG, higher mortality after the non live DTP, and then reduced mortality again after measles vaccine. And this is really um, kind of suggestive that live vaccines have, benef have le beneficial off target effects, and non live vaccines have, um, have not, do not have beneficial effects, and therefore higher mortality and reversed. And these are all the same studies, so it's hard to think of a bias that would change the bias during the same study. And you can see that this study, the same pattern, the same patterns, same pattern here and the same here. This study from, Guinea, um, from Papua New Guinea was later um, removed from the systematic analysis because of methodological problems, so it doesn't really count. So there is this concern that if many participants have had flu vaccine before their BCG, could this mitigate some of the off-target effects? So this is something we'll need to look for carefully. Um, and there is some immunological evidence for how this might um, occur, again, from behind the tier who will be speaking next. So this is a very important point to be looking at in these BCG trials. And the final point is that, of course, um, very large, many parts of the world, BCG, of course, is still routinely given. And so many participants in our studies will have previously had BCG, and if they're randomized to the BCG group, it'll be BCG um, revaccination. And in fact, in the BRACE study, we've recruited nearly 4,000 participants today, and of those, at least half have previously had BCG. So it'll be very important to look at whether BCG revaccination has a different effect to just BCG vaccination. And of course, we also have to take into consideration there will be some participants who have latent tuberculosis. In our study, we will be looking um, at with using IGRAs in those participants from Brazil to see whether latent TB also has any effect on either COVID or the any protective effect of the BCG vaccine. So the question is, can a vaccine from 1921 save lives from COVID-19? This is from BBC News just a couple of days ago announcing the BRACE trial moving into the UK. Now, this is how not to find out if BCG reduces the impact of COVID-19. There are many ecological studies that have looked at rates of COVID-19 and the rates of BCG vaccination. And there are a number of studies then discussing those, there are a number of papers then discussing those papers. But um, and particularly this one, I like this one, stop playing with the data. Um, there is no sound evidence that BCG may avoid SARS-CoV-2 infection. Unfortunately, they've kind of um, undone that great title with us for now at the end, but I think very true. And the point this paper makes is that the articles um, that um, are suggesting that looking at BCG rates and COVID rates in different countries gives you some kind of clue as to whether this might work 
are highly flawed and many of them are unfortunately of quite low quality. And the main problem, of course, is that countries are at different stages of their epidemic curve, have different testing policies and reporting, healthcare systems have different capacities. There are age distribution, very big differences in age distribution, and we know that's a confounder. And the most important thing is that it's very difficult to find out actually um, the BCG vaccination status and the prevalence of vaccination in different countries. There isn't really one good, accurate source. So I would hazard, um, I would give, I would hazard you're looking at those studies and have a fair degree of caution. Um, so, of course, what we really need is the highest standard of evidence. And you can see from this pyramid of levels of evidence that RCTs are right at the top, followed by systematic reviews. But there is one thing that actually is bigger and more important than even these, and that's at the top in yellow. And that really is simply Twitter. And you'll see from Twitter that Donald Trump um, has recently tweeted that he did not have BCG vaccine. Um, I did not have BCG vaccine. I got the corona bug. That's all you need to know hey, maybe this BCG stuff might also be good to prevent tuberculosis. Maybe he's right. So I'd like to finish there. I'd like to finish by thanking the funders, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who've given a sizable um, donation for us to enable us to take this study internationally. And particularly, I'd like to thank all of the people. These are all the people at least working in the Melbourne site. There are many others working in different countries that I really am too many to mention. But these are the key people who've really got the brace study and moving and of course they've been doing this under very difficult circumstances predominantly um, by Zoom as I know many of you will have too. So I'm going to finish there and I'll be very happy to take part in the questions that follow. So thank you. <laughs>